Today's perspective segment zooms in on animal rights here in France. Our guest today is Melvin Joss, the country's first professional lobbyist for this cause. He's also uh, writing a thesis at Leicester University in the UK on the repression of activists um, across uh, Europe. Thank you very much for coming in to talk to us Good here morning. on France Thank 24. For the invitation. Thank you very much for coming. Um, first of all, can you paint our viewers a picture of the state of animal rights currently in France? What have some of the most uh, recent and shocking scandals been? Well, basically, um, France is lagging behind as a country in Europe in terms of its animal welfare legislation. Uh, if you look at uh, farm animal uh, practices, basically, uh, the French law never goes beyond the minimum standards set by the EU. Uh, we then have um, specificities in France, uh, like uh, hunting with hounds, uh, which is a particularly cruel from, uh, form of hunting that has been outlawed elsewhere. Um, then uh, bullfighting is still happening in the south of France. We have uh, the production of foie gras with the force feeding of ducks and geese, which has been outlawed in many countries. And uh, in the last few years, many scandals uh, involving slaughterhouses and, and farms uh, have been making um, outcries in France. And presumably this is why you wanted to set up your political lobbying group? Yes, well, basically what we realised is that with those scandals, um, um, the, the the public opinion in France was evolving in the right direction and, and understanding that uh, uh, animal rights was an, um, a real issue. Uh, but at the same time, this wasn't translating into political action or a change in the legislation. So we tried to think about what the reasons were. And, and many activists would say, OK, in France, we have particularly strong animal exploitation lobbies, and that's why we're not progressing. And we thought, well, maybe there's you know, also we should look at how we organize as a movement in France. And we realized that not many um, animal NGOs were doing <coughs> lobbying work in France, and those who did were doing it more uh, on, with um, an expert approach, so drafting bills or parliamentary questions, etc. But they weren't really trying to create a network of political allies in order to be able to mobilize um, politicians, members of the parliament, uh, on our issues. So that's what we're trying to do with CAP. We now represent 800 uh, animal NGOs across France. And we um, present their demands to members of parliament, members of the government. We've been received uh, uh, by advisors of the prime minister, of um, the president. And uh, we try to sound out the, the interest of different uh, MPs, for example, on different issues, because sometimes they can not have an interest in hunting, for example, but then be willing to act on uh, farming practices or on animals in circuses and so on. And that's interesting for us to know who we can count on on different issues. I was going to point out to our viewers that CAP, CAP is your, your lobbying group, but Convergence Animal uh, Politique, which has now been around for about um, a year now. Um, what do you make of the, the current French government's uh, position and stance on animal rights? Well, basically, the government uh, doesn't really have a uh, stance on, on, on animal rights and uh, very probably it hadn't realised how much of a public issue it had become. And uh, we know from different MPs, for example, that um, with the, the bill on agriculture and food that was uh, uh, going through Parliament this year, um, they, so they, they had um, put an article on animal welfare in it and uh, they thought they could get away with it. Um, and uh, they weren't expecting um, so much um, um, uh, return from you know, citizens and, and NGOs and MPs uh, on this issue. So apparently they were surprised that uh, it was so much of an issue. So maybe we, we can hope that uh, they will do something on, on that. You've also been looking at how animal rights groups have been repressed across Europe in a, in a, more, in a, in a more wider picture. Talk us through what you found in your thesis. Um, well, basically, I found that there was no correlation with uh, uh, violent actions by the movement in different countries and the occurrence of repression, but there was more of a correlation between the success of the movement and the occurrence of repression. And in a few words, um, I distinguish between three forms of three main forms of repression: uh, what I call coercive repression, which would be what most people would think about as repression, so arrests, uh, cracking down on demonstrations, etc., infiltration. Uh, legislative criminalization, which would be the fact of uh, creating new laws to specifically outlaw certain activism practices when it comes to animal rights. 
and uh, discursive criminalization, which would be the fact of spreading a rhetoric, uh, criminalizing activists as terrorists, eco-terrorists, eco um, animal rights extremists, etc. And that serves to justify the harsher forms of repression. Okay, Melvin Joss, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us. That was uh, Melvin you. Joss, uh, the uh, first uh, professional lobbyist here in France on animal rights. Thank you very much. Thank you.